Thanks very much, and it's great to be here. Um, when, when Greg was introducing me, there were, uh, I, I couldn't help but remember the, the, the quote about an expert witness is someone who um, is from out of town with a briefcase. An academic expert is someone from out of town with a former in his title. So I've got a lot of formers in that title. So I hope I'm a little bit current still um, on China investment in Africa. Uh, the subtext of, of, my, of my speech is, is going to be, um, is this investment in Africa, is it a winning investment or an unholy alliance? And so that's what I want for you all to think about. Um, <clears throat> is it a winning investment, t China teaming up with Africa, or somehow is this an unholy affair? Um, of course, uh, it's from whose perspective that you have to ask that question. If you're a Chinese electric electricity producer and you're getting a very full and complete supply of coal to burn in your electric power plant in Guangzhou, this is a winning combination because you're getting coal from Africa that you've never had access to before. If you are uh, Chevron or Exxon and you are competing against Chinese in West Africa oil and gas concessions, this might seem like an unholy alliance. Um, and if you're an African citizen, how would you view it? And that's a question that remains to be seen and we'll talk about that. The history of China and Africa, you think kind of obscure, kind of different, um, but in fact it's a roller coaster relationship of very much on and off. In the 13th century and the 15th century, in the Ming Dynasty particularly, China had a good deal of naval power and was constantly surveying and being involved with the East African coastline. Today, Somalia and Kenya and Tanzania were frequented by, by Chinese traders, by Chinese explorers. Um, there was one particular Chinese admiral who was noted for making multiple trips to the East Coast. In fact, you have these fabulous 15th century silk screens in China depicting giraffes and elephants. So clearly there's this very interesting connection dating back centuries. But then we saw very little involvement between China and Africa for a number of hundreds of years. It really wasn't until the 20th century, 1960s and 1970s, that you see China re-engage in Africa. And, and what was the motivation there? You know, the Communist Party in China was in in total control, and they had political and ideological interests in Africa. Politically, they were driven by two things. One was Taiwan. Remember in the 60s and 70s, the, the conflict or the contest between Taiwan and mainland China, uh, particularly for UN votes and recognition, was intense. So the Chinese were constantly occurring and actively bringing along Africans to vote for them for their recognition for their UN seat. And the second political tension or competitor was the Soviet Union. Although both Marxist-Leninist, they had con some, some real competition in Africa um, for, for who they were going to help. And who were they helping? What were they doing? They were supplying um, and funding anti-colonial movements. So that's where the ideological part came in. It was throw off the shackles, anti-colonial, we're going to help our brothers and sisters in Africa get rid of these French, British, Portuguese um, and have a, a, a new society. Now there was some commerce that the Chinese conducted in those, in those years, 60s and 70s, but not a lot. Um, the Tanzam Railroad, for instance, was built. That's the railroad linking Zambia to Tanzania from um, Lusaka to Dar es Salaam. Um, and the Chinese built it and it's still running today. But it wasn't driven, this relationship between China and Africa was not driven by commerce. It was really driven by politics and ideology. Now, that went on for a good couple decades. <laughs> 
But by the late 80s, China was very much withdrawing again from Africa. It's this on-again, off-again relationship. Um, and they were pulling back, and where they had 25 or 30 embassies in the 60s and 70s, by 1990, they had two or three. I think Morocco and, and South Africa. Um, so there was this withdrawal again. And for roughly two decades, we saw very little going on. The shop was closed. Um, then, right around when Greg suggested, 2002, we started seeing Chinese getting reintroduced and reinvolved and reinvigorated about Africa. And what was driving them this time? It wasn't politics. Certainly wasn't ideology. It was commerce. This was about business. And from 2002 to about 2006, you saw a rapid ramping up of trade, commercial interest, primary driven, primarily driven by natural resources. China needed Africa's commodities. They needed the copper, the cobalt, the vanadium, the chromium, the manganese, the coal, the oil. They needed what Africa had in their ground and they needed it to fuel their industrial base that was ever expanding in Guangzhou and Shanghai and Beijing. They needed a supply chain. So they were there in Africa buying the copper and buying the platinum so they can make those industries back home sufficient and working. In 1995, the trade between China and Africa was $3 billion, very small. By 2009, that $3 billion had grown to $120 billion. Trade between China and Africa was $120 billion, making China Africa's largest trading partner. Africa imports and exports more from China than any other single country. So much of that trade was commodities, and coming back into Africa was everything from telecommunications supplies to plastic toys to textiles, a whole wide spectrum of mostly consumer goods. But then by 2005, we again see this relationship between China and Africa take another turn. And instead of just buying the copper and the cobalt and the coal and the oil, the Chinese decided they needed to own it. If they really wanted that plant in Guangzhou to have a steady supply of titanium, is it okay to have a two-year contract? It's better to own the titanium mine. So you see the shifting going from off-take agreements, long-term contracts with African mines and minerals, to equity ownership. They were buying the mine. What better way to have a vertically integrated, sure supply for your industrial base back home? Ownership's an interesting thing. And when China went after ownership of these assets, they did it in a very comprehensive way. And I think it's worth just taking a few minutes to, to look at a couple of the deals that China did in order to gain ownership. And the one I would like to look at is an Angola oil deal. The Chinese were very drawn to offshore Angola oil production, high reserves, um, low sulfur, uh, light crude, perfect for the Chinese market. Some blocks were coming up, some very important blocks, offshore blocks in Angola, and Sinopec and Sinuk in particular decided this was their opportunity. So, what are the quid pro quos? 
what can China Inc., that rather mercantilist system that we shorthand call China Inc., what could they do to reassure the Angolans that they were worthy partners and owners of these offshore oil blocks? Well, China Inc. put together a package. First, 13 billion cash loan. 13 billion right here. Now that 13 billion, if you look at it, will, was going to be and will be repaid, not in cash, but by oil. Um, second, let's rebuild the Banguela Railroad. The Banguela Railroad was a, an, a rail line that was built in the colonial times, destroyed in the war uh, between UNITA and the MPLA, completely dysfunctional, um, needed literally hundreds of bridges and culverts, um, and it went from the port of Benguela all the way into the Congo and was an incredibly strategic line to extract the copper and cobalt from uh, Katanga, the southern province of the DRC. So the Chinese cut the deal. They rebuilt the railroad. Now, when they cut this deal with the Angolans, they did not tell them that that the Chinese were actually going to rebuild the railroad with Chinese labor. The Angolans assumed that they would use local labor. And yet, the Chinese to this day have brought somewhere between 20 and 30,000 Chinese laborers to build the railroad. Incidentally, um, there's speculation that some of that labor uh, was actually convict labor came out of prisons in Guangzhou. Um, and the deal was cut. The Chinese did in fact get the lucrative offshore blocks and the railroad is being built and will probably be finished by 2011 or 2012. So, what are the Chinese looking at now? What are their commercial interests now? Yes, it's definitely still the commodities, metals and mines, um, and oil and gas, but now it's expanding. Agriculture has become very interesting, not just for the Chinese, but for everybody. We see Middle East interest in agriculture. We see Korean interest in agriculture. Um, and there is still a fair amount of arable land in Africa um, that is not being planted, that's not being harvested, that's lying fallow, and you're seeing increasing interest in agricultural production to provide food security. And Greg asked me a question earlier today about climate change, and this very much has a connection to climate change. As the world looks at climate change and realizes that there's going to be less and less land to grow, where can we grow crops right now that aren't being grown, and much of that unused land, so to speak, is in Africa. So you're seeing quite an interest in food security. Second area where we really see a big Chinese interest and a big uptick is construction. Now, part of that is kind of the China Inc. quid pro quo, rebuilding the railroad and doing the ports, um, but it also provides construction and engineering companies in China, which are growing and expanding and becoming ever more sophisticated, into new markets. So they're taking their engineering skills and their construction skills and taking them to Africa and building roads and ports and railroads and hospitals um, and telecommunications networks. Um, Huawei is a tremendous example of how, how Chinese telecommunications and IT is moving into Africa pipelines and, and schools and hospitals. So we're getting a, a huge, wide, broad section of, of construction interests. And finally, the third major area that we're seeing Chinese interested in is banking, financial. The Industrial and Commercial Bank of, of China bought 20% of Standard Bank, which is based in South Africa. It's the largest, actually the, the largest in market cap terms, bank in Africa and Chinese now have owned 20% of that equity. The China Development Bank has teamed up with United Bank of Nigeria, one of the big Nigerian banks, um, and actually owns some equity in that. And you're seeing more and more Chinese banks across the continent 
opening branches and doing increasing business. And part of that is because it is good business and you can make loans and get paid on your, on your, on your loans, but a lot of it is about deal flow. It's the banks that know about the deal flow and a bank that knows that there is a vanadium mine in, in, in Namibia that's going to come up for sale because they financed it and they know it and they're local. And so if you own 20% of Standard Bank, you're getting a peek into that deal flow. What's coming up? What's going to be on the market? And that's incredibly important for serious investors that want to, to, to come into emerging markets, especially a place like Africa. So we have commercially motivated China Inc. hard at work. But if I could, let me take a slightly different perspective. And this was uh, a quote that I'm going to read you from a friend who is an Oxford academic. <coughs> Probably has a former in his title too. Um, he's very bright. Um, probably a little further to the left on the, on, the, on the political spectrum than I am, but I have great respect for him and I really, I really think um, he kind of nailed it. He said, you know, slavery, colonialism, apartheid, Cold War manipulation, IMF structural adjustments. If Africa chooses to seek new relationships with China, the West should not be puzzled. What he is saying is, you guys, us guys, have screwed this thing up so badly for so many years. Why is it surprising to you that the Africans are not interested in reaching out and welcoming the Chinese? So, back to my original question. Um, is this a winning investment? Uh, this China-Africa link? Or is it trouble? Well, let's take a look at it from the African's perspective. Is China invol involvement good for my country if I'm an African? Railroads are being built. Yeah, I mean, it's Chinese labor that's coming over. Um, I'd rather have my local people be having jobs. But nonetheless, the railroad's getting built, and trains are going to be running, and I'm going to have additional commerce on that rail, and then my port is going to be a lot more viable because of that railroad. I'm getting a new parliament, a new state house that, Greg, you were talking about earlier in Togo, opera houses in Abidjan. Now, is the quality of the construction good? Yeah, primarily it's pretty good. There was some trouble in Ethiopia where the Chinese built an elaborate road system and some of it wasn't so great. Um, but, yeah, the price was right. Uh, as an African citizen, um, does it worry me that my quasi-authoritarian government is working so closely with the Chinese and thus enabling them to stay in power and they're not really democratically elected and I'm not sure I like that? I'm thinking particularly, say, Zimbabwe, where the Chinese came at some very critical times and enabled Robert Mugabe to sustain his regime um, with cash and loans. Or Sudan would be an example too. Although even there you have an interesting case where the Chinese played a very positive role during this most recent referendum and really kind of quietly went to Khartoum and read them the riot act and said you're going to let this referendum go through. So some interesting positive pressure there too. And ultimately if I'm an African I have to ask is the Chinese investment and the Chinese interest in my country, is it spurning growth? Is it helping my economy? Is it giving my cousin and my nephew a job? And in many cases, the Chinese investment is doing exactly that. Now, at what cost to that African society is that job being created? Zambia is an interesting example. About three years ago, two and a half years ago, there was a presidential election in Zambia. And the key political difference between the two presidential candidates was their position on 
China. How they viewed Chinese investment, Chinese local uh, workers, um, particularly an incident that occurred right during that, that rather tense presidential um, election was a, at a textile, mall, a textile plant um, in Zambia owned by the Chinese that went on strike. The Zambian workers went on strike for better wages and better conditions. And the Chinese security guards ended up opening fire and shooting and killing a handful of Zambians. Well, that really flared this kind of this, you know, pro or anti-China, you know, and it really brought that, that, that political tension to a head. Now, interestingly enough, the presidential candidate that was pro-Chinese won and he is now the president of Zambia. Now that's not to say that there still aren't tensions going on within Zambian society over, over some of these Chinese investments, um, but it seems to be calming down and working out. I think it will take some more years to really answer the question, is this a good thing or a bad thing for Africa? Um, and I think it is still very much um, up in the air how the Africans and the Chinese work together. And I think it's an evolving picture um, and will continue to evolve. Now, one issue that has come up is how does the U.S. or how does Europe, how does the West possibly compete against this China Inc.? And it really comes down to the notion of a mercantilist system versus a more pure capitalist system. That's rather simplistic. But, but China Inc. is just that. I mean, it is Sinopec and, and Sinuk and, and the state-owned banks coming in and offering a very attractive package. Chevron is not going to be able to build the Benguela Railroad. They're just not. They're not going to be able to compete for those blocks in Angola because they don't have the deep pockets that China does. And when you're Sinopec and you can come in with the Industrial Bank of China in your back pocket to make a $13 billion loan and build the railroad, you're going to beat Chevron every time. Mercantilist versus capitalist, or mercantilist, state, parastatal versus private sector. We see this rivalry, um, and it's going to be very interesting to see how that works out. I was having this discussion with, with, a, with a, a, an economist friend at one of the think tanks in Washington, and um, uh, I said, so what's the answer? How do, how do we compete? I mean, you know. Conoco Phillips is not going to not going to build the port. Um, how do we how are we going to compete against that? And his suggestion, which is I'm not I haven't quite thought it all the way through, is you know maybe maybe we need to become more mercantilist. You know maybe our government needs to have a commodity fund where we loan money to junior entrepreneurs and junior mining companies to go compete in Africa. Uh, and, and, and have subsidized loans for our, our private sector. Anyways, I'm still thinking that one through, and I'd like your opinion too on that. Um, my final thought is this, and I will, I will open this up to questions because I've rattled on too long. Um, it's somewhat of a paradox that um, Western companies see China as such a tough competitor, but they do. But they also like them there because the exit today for many American investments and many European investments, the exit, and every good MBA student knows what an exit is, so the liquidity event that gets you out and gets your cash, the exit is you sell it to the Chinese. They like it. Now, not everyone and not every industry, but to have the Chinese there in business terms is what we call a market maker. 
They are a market maker. They're making the market. They might pay the low price, but they're there and they're going to pay. So maybe it's the same for the Africans and the Europeans and the Americans. Maybe we both really do want China there, but it scares us. I'll leave it there and we'll, we'll do some questions. Okay, thanks. And Walter's going to take your questions um, directly, so put up your hands. And I don't know, do we have a wandering microphone as the plan or just speak up? Screen. <laughs> yes. Hi, sir. I'm an Army fellow here at uh, UC. My question is, uh, from a strategic aspect over here, how much China, I, I like your comments, and how much you're getting involved in strategic metals uh, and, and looking at, I mean, they already control a, a significant share of the market on those, and I know we have some things like beryllium and that, but what's your perspective on that is maybe they're trying to get a foothold also on some of the strategic material yeah. that are out there. And in, that's a good question, and in fact, the... Um, the think tank guy that I was talking to about, he, he was saying, well, maybe we should be more mercantilist and maybe we should do these private equity funds. Part of what he said is, is let's get our strategic minerals stockpiles back up to speed and let's us enter into the buying and selling. And, and you know, we saw this um, uh, earlier uh, in this year and, and late last year on the rare earths where China exports quite a bit of rare earth um, minerals, which are just that. They're quite rare. Uh, and in fact, they started holding back their exports because they needed them for their plasma TV production and they needed them for their IT production. Um, and so and it was kind of in that context that this guy said, we need to do more with our stockpiles. Um, and not just the rare earths, but the vanadium and the chromium and the manganese and the platinum. Um, so I think our government is probably looking at that. My guess is, you know, DOD is looking at strategic mineral supplies. Um, and, you know, in, the, in, the, in kind of in, the, in those years of the 60s and 70s and 80s, as the East-West tension um, was still very much in, in, in play, you know, Africa's strategic importance was always kind of the textbook strategic importance was sea lanes and minerals. That's, that's why Africa was interesting to us in kind of the cold world framework. Now, I would like to think it's evolved a lot from there, um, and I think it has. Uh, but in, the old, in those old basic cold warrior terms, that, that's, those were the two main things. Um, but I take your point. I think the strategic minerals um, is just as important to our economy as it is, is to the European or the Chinese. Yes. Hi, uh, Robert Nicholson. I'm a dual degree master's student at the LBJ School and with uh, Russian Affairs. My question is about uh, the recent referendum in Sudan and with the oil and with China's oil interest there. It was interesting that um, you brought uh, that you said that China had uh, peacefully uh, brought up uh, kind of an ultimatum on passing this uh, on the South Sudan referendum. And I would have thought that uh, China would have been in favor of keeping uh, keeping Sudan intact, given that a lot of their oil uh, interests are along the fault line of Sudan. Would you please explain uh, the Chinese um, uh, the Chinese uh, thinking that went along with that, and uh, how other African countries could uh, take a lesson from Sudan if, in case, even what we had in the Middle East unrest were to come into their territories? Good, good question. And and um, I think the first choice for the Chinese, and I dare say for most of the international community, including Washington, the first choice on Sudan was a unified state. The, the entire peace process that was, that was worked out um, back in 03 and 04 and 05 was in fact to, to push the referendum out as far as you could, it was six and a half years which was finally agreed to, in order for the unified state to demonstrate that they are better off, Sudan is better off staying together. Now, it didn't work and the referendum was overwhelmingly for, for secession and an independent South Sudan and that's fine. I think the, the, the Chinese, your instincts are exactly right, the Chinese first choice would have been for it to stay together. But when it was so apparent that, that it was going to split and that it wasn't even going to be close, I mean, you know, it was going to be 90 some percent, the Chinese were flexible enough and diplomatic enough and, 
they actually went to Juba in the south and, and worked with the southern Sudanese um, and said, look, we look forward to being your partner. When it all breaks apart, we are going to be your partner in, in some of those oil fields. Um, let's work together. And, and when, when they had that kind of awakening, and I don't know when it was, um, they also went to, to Khartoum and said, don't stand in the way of this. Make this thing happen. We need this to be peaceful. We need those oil fields to keep pumping, and we want to keep owning them. Yes? And it seems that a lot, similar to your presentation, that a lot is being attributed or viewing China with this centralized kind of planning in terms of we're going to use this methodology to extend our supply chain. But really, can't a lot of these transactions be simply explained by the capital and national wealth transfer that Western nations, Europe and the uh, U.S., are making to China, and now just with this excess money, they're like, well, okay, we'll go ahead and buy some oil fields because we can do it with cash. I mean, it, I, I just want to kind of parse out the difference between these resources that they have available because of our own demand patterns and consume, consumption patterns that have given them this excess of capital versus maybe a nationalized plan or like you know some very directed plan to go forward. Yeah, and I think it's a combination of both. I think that, you know, when, when Greg was going out to all our embassies in 2002, um, the Chinese were doing it much more from a five-year plan. Um, they didn't have the huge cash reserves then. They were building, but by 2002, they, they weren't all that. I mean, they had sovereign wealth funds, but they weren't like they are today. Um, and, but they did absolutely know that if they were going to continue to grow their industrial base, they absolutely had to have these natural resources. I think it played beautifully um, five, six, seven, eight, now nine years later, their cash surplus and their balance sheet is enormous and gives them the wherewithal to be a real player buying real assets uh, without a lot of pain. And I think that's your point. They've got the cash. Why not go buy it? Um, and at the same time, it does secure their supply chain. Um, I think... I th and, and, you know, who knows, but I, my guess is it started with we need our supplies and it ended with we need our supplies and we got a lot of cash. Um, now, how much oil is China taking out of Africa versus how much oil America is taking out of Africa? It's not even close. We're taking way more oil than China is. Now, that's a little bit of a misnomer because because hydrocarbons are fungible. And if you, know, if, you, if you don't get it here, you get it there, and it's a world market, you know, it's not really. For instance, we get more oil out of Angola than we do out of Kuwait. You know, that, that doesn't really mean anything, except physically, you know, the transportation is closer from the Atlantic coast of Angola to Philadelphia or Houston or Galveston to refine it. Um, so, but, but it is, it's a reality. We, we do take more barrels per day out of Africa than China does. Yes? Hi, um, I'm a PhD student in the government department. Uh, my question is actually about uh, China's ownership of assets in Africa. And um, you talked about how the mines, the oil fields, they moved from signing long term leases to actually owning the oil fields. And um, I work on their, invest, their acquisition of agricultural land, China's acquisition of agricultural land in Africa. So I'm just wondering, currently... Well, you can come to the stage. Yeah, <laughs> currently, they're just signing long-term leases. And so I'm wondering if you think that they're going, they're trying to move to actual ownership of this land, because if so, that would have you know, great implications for property rights regimes in Africa. I, I have not heard of any example of um, a Chinese company getting freehold title, so to speak. Um, mostly because that's not how African land works. It's all, it's all, not all, but the vast majority of Africa is, is, is leasehold or concession at best. So um, the, the tradition of private property rights is, is, is not the same as ours. So um, I don't know of any example of China owning um, actual title to, to agricultural land. What you're seeing is them coming in and, and taking 10-year concessions 15, 25-year concessions. Um, 
the, uh, and I'm sure you've looked at this, the, the Daiwu case in Madagascar. I mean, it was fascinating. I mean, that was a million acres. Um, and that wasn't ownership either. That was a, I think that was a 99-year lease or something. But it was, a, it was a lease kind of thing. And that's, that's going to be most likely the, the economic structure that, that agriculture follows. I have not. No, I have not. It would be terribly ironic since private property rights in China itself is a little bit fu <laughs> fuzzy. Yes. Yes, I had a question about uh, the Africa command that the U.S. military is trying to set up. I don't know if they actually found the host country yet. Maybe my fellow Army veteran can, can speak to that. Still that. Still so this goes along with uh, the, the perspective you said about the unholy alliance. You, you mentioned that probably Africans won't forget that China was one of the countries that did help them in their anti colonial uh, struggles against. I think you've got within that struggle, you've got the U.S. as, as, as part of that. I mean, you mentioned the Angola, and I remember, I think the book I read was from the Angola Kings, which was written by an ex CIA agent who was actually from uh, Texas, I think, uh, Austin. So I, I thought that was kind of uh, ironic. So I can't, I can't, we can't just skip over because I think it's a lot of Africans. Certainly, a lot of African Americans. It was and still is an unholy alliance with with the West. Exactly, and that was what that was that that Oxford Don's quote to me was was he wasn't just talking about Europeans. He was talking about Americans too. I mean, you know, it was the CIA who flew in the the, the weapon supply to Savimbi. I mean, it's not like you got your hands clean, buddy. Um, so no, I would definitely include the U.S. In, into that Western category. We did not have colonies like France, Belgium, Britain, Portugal, Spain, um, but we definitely had involvement. Yes? Okay, this is um, another from comparative literature. Okay, uh, thank you very much for this talk. That really sticks to my mind because Growing up in the Africans, I can go on all and on and on with different anecdotal examples of how China was involved when I was still in the Ivory Coast. I mean, I can go on and on, but that's not the point here. I just have a question about culture. Because I, one of the reasons why the collaboration between the West and Africa has gone on for centuries was because of the cultural transposition of trans, trans, is that transparency. Okay, but right now, as we see, we don't see a major uh, cultural transposition from China to Africa. So I wonder to what extent can this collaboration work without the cultural aspect? Thank you. Great question. And I think, I think that was at the very heart of that, that conflict I was talking about in Zambia in the, with the textile. Um, it was a cultural disconnect. Um, the Chinese management simply didn't understand why um, the Zambians couldn't work seven days a week. <laughs> we work seven days a week. What's wrong with you? Um, so again, a cultural disconnect. Um, now, you could say the cultural disconnect between Europe and, and, and Africa has been there too. I mean, we do have obvious linkages. Um, we, have, we have religious linkages. We have some cultural link linkages. Um, so there probably is greater similarities, although, you know, we, we, we speak common languages just enough to fight each other, and, <laughs> and, and so it, it gets confusing there, too. Um, but I take your point. I think that I think there are some big cultural disconnects between um, the Far East and Africa. Yes? And my question is, have you seen China any attempt from China to influence education in Africa? Because, you know, like, if people are educated, they get self-aware and they're more aware of their interests. Have you seen any influence? I have, I, I, in two ways. Uh, one, um, I've seen China build schools um, and build a lot of schools uh, um, all through Africa. You see, you see, you know, 
Chinese construction companies building, building schools that, that China is paying for. Um, the second way is a little more self-serving, and that is uh, Chinese language. You're seeing Chinese language centers being set up, particularly in South Africa, and I think Kenya's got one now, where they are, are teaching Africans uh, the Chinese language. Um, it's education. might be self-serving education, but I mean, it, so y yes, you're starting to see some of that. Yes? Uh, just a quick question. Uh, in thinking about competition, uh, do current international trade incentives factor this way very much, I think specifically about foreign trade zones here and special economic zones abroad. Um, are these just a drop in the lowest supply chain bucket or does it have a real impact? Um, you know, the, the foreign trade zones in Africa, um, we, we take advantage of and our companies take advantage of. Um, it's not absolutely critical. I mean, I don't think it's going to ever make or break a, you know, a, a deal, but does it help? It does help. And I think in a similar kind of way, um, w what is called AGOA, which is the African Growth and Opportunity Act or something like that, um, has, been, has been helpful. Has it been a kind of a sea change? AGOA is, a, is a, um, basically a uh, duty-free, uh, structure that allows African goods into the United States duty-free. And there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of African goods ranging from textiles to whatever that n now come into the U.S. duty-free. Um, has it helped? Yeah, it has helped. And, it, it, and it, it increases the margins, just like sometimes the free trade zones, increase the margins for the African um, entrepreneur that's exporting those goods to our country. Um, so it's, it's helpful. Is it, is it, you know, the end all and be all? Um, you know, probably not. Yes. Hi, I'm Kathy Good. I'm a professor of government. Uh, I was wondering uh, what you saw as possible change over time in the spatial um, focus of Chinese investment. You know, when you talk about the extractive industries like oil, it's kind of easy to say, you know, obviously they're going to go where the oil is. And it's kind of easy to make an enclave investment or an offshore investment in, you know, brutal dictatorship that, you know, really can just clear the way for the Chinese to come to operate within their enclave. But when you start talking about industry, as you were in Zambia or agricultural lands, you get much more involved in the politics and you're more reliant on the capacity of government to negotiate with groups in civil society and uh, especially things about the acquisition of agricultural land. Do you see any uh, sort of rhyme or reason as to where the Chinese are going in their attempts to acquire land? So for example, do they think it tends to be easier to buy to access land in Tanzania than elsewhere? Or I, how do you see that? I, I I think, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm hardly an expert on it, but um, I think it's driven by two things. One, where do they have good relationships? Because land is sensitive, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, that's a tough thing to be kind of diving in on. So where do they have good relationships with which, which, with which governments at the, at the very top? Um, and so if they feel that they have a, some rapport with, with uh, Tanzania or pick your tone, Cote d'Ivoire or whatever, they're going to take that, number one. And number two, where's the arable land with the rainfall? Yeah. They're agriculturalists. They need to grow this stuff. It can't be marginal. It's going to have to be viable, producing, healthy, good farmland. So I think those are their two main factors. Um, and to your main point, though, as I, as I heard you, it's it is a different ball game. When you're hiring local farmers to, to grow the, the maize or the sorghum or the soybeans or whatever they're going to try to grow, um, that is a, a very kind of holistic, serious day-to-day -day relationship that you, you know, if you're doing an offshore rig, you just take your Chinese engineers and plop down the rig and, you know, yeah, you see them a little bit. But but that is a, uh, and I think that's going to be where the interesting test is into your question about the culture and how all this relationship really works out. Um, 
and I don't know, you know, this is total speculation. Maybe the Chinese will realize, you know what? We need some distance here. Let's hire the Africans to do this. We're just going to take we're just going to take the the crops. We're not going to manage this situation. We don't know how. This is not working out, but we're going to keep getting the crops. I mean, I'm that's total. I that, that and that's maybe one way it kind of evolves. Um, but land is is sensitive, and agriculture is sensitive. I, I just to, just to remind when you were asking that question, it reminded me we were involved in a <coughs> in a in a um, offshore gas uh, concession. Um, we were advising a, an American company, and and um, we got to the to the part where you start laying out what are your requirements. You have to shoot so much seismic by this date. You have to drill one well by this an year anniversary. You have to drill three more wells after that. And you know there's there are proper you know timelines and your obligations to have that concession. You can't just sit on it and just wait. Um, but one of the concession um, points was you have to buy local. And this East African country really was stuck on this, we want you, you guys, to come in and buy local stuff. And we said, yeah, not, not a problem, you know, and that's kind of standard. If, it's, if it is comparative price, you buy local. I mean, like Seismic, for instance, uses dynamite. You got to put the uh, small charges of dynamite to shoot your seismic. And um, if the dynamite is the same price um, in, in Africa as it is in Rotterdam, you buy the Africa stuff. Um, so we kind of went back to the, the, the basic you know, formula that everybody uses. And these, the, the, it was Tanzania. The Tanzanians were really, really fixated on this. And we kind of finally took a break and, you know, he said, what, you know, we'll, we'll, we want to work this out. What's, what's, what's getting you? He said, well, we just did a ch deal with the Chinese about six months ago. And they have come in with everything in containers, all the seismic equipment, all the engineers. And when they finally showed up with a container of bottled water from China, we said, that's enough. <laughs> You're buying local. So back to your point. How is that going to work on agriculture? I mean, when it is all local, I mean, it's all about seeds and markets and local farmers, and I think it's going to be a challenge. Yes? I just have one quick question, because in the Golden Gas Area International, the IOC said for years, all of the pieces that they've signed have local content, they have... Uh, a certain a, a, a training period, so yep. a certain period of time, yep. it will all be uh, local people who live in the management area. Yes. And, and now I'm speaking mostly from most of the South American countries that I've seen, and I'm sure, and I know the Nigerians are certainly proactive in that area. But why did that not translate to Chinese deals to. Uh, and then my second question is they're very. And I think the second part of your question, I think, is the, the and I'm presuming to understand um, Chinese business practices, and I, I shouldn't because I don't really, but I th my guess is they think it will work it out. We can always cut a deal. Let's not go to arbitration. We don't need to go to arbitration. We can work it out. Um, I think that's kind of the, the approach in the culture. Um, on the production sharing agreements um, and the, and the uh, rollout on any concession, it's pretty standard everywhere. I mean, and um, the Chinese seem to have agreed to many of those production sharing agreements, but not all of them. And so they do seem to get some interesting, interesting carve-outs and clawbacks. Um, that that normally you don't see in today's in today's hydrocarbon world. Um, I think, yeah, I think there's a transparency problem with that. I will say this though. I think um, in the last few years we're seeing China move into more standard business operating procedures. So I think 
production sharing agreements that are being signed now are much more standard than they were three, four, five years ago. So I think it's actually going in the right direction, so to speak. Yes? Talk a little bit about how China has an advantage compared to the international oil companies in getting access to resources. Uh, now that we have seen certain democratic movements in northeast of Africa, do you see Chinese influence helping African countries like Angola move the other way in terms of consolidating their power because now they don't need to access American companies or Western companies that just go to China? Um, I think so. <laughs> the short answer is I think that's right. Um, I think the Africans have become pretty good at, as they should, at playing one off against the other. Um, I think they've become quite adept at it. Uh, now, they've been pretty good at playing off Shell from Total, from BP, from Chevron too. So you know that the you know the the business and the government leadership in many of these African countries are pretty darn sophisticated, and they get the game pretty quick. But it's very helpful for them to have a Chinese bidder in the, in the in the in the closet as well. Um, and and you're seeing it you know you're seeing it play out in interesting ways. In Ghana, for instance, there's a wonderful huge discovery called the Jubilee Field, um, and um, some American companies tried to, to buy into that, and the Chinese were just right there, ready, 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 and it, 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 it's, everything's been kind of put on hold. Um, and, you know, the Ghanaians wanted to claw back some of it for their own national petroleum company, for their, and their own NOC, and so they were going to use the Chinese capital to help them claw theirs back. So it, it, everyone's using everybody. I mean, let's let's be honest here. I mean, it's uh, it's it's becoming a very interesting game. Yes. Hi, I'm Adam Collier from the LBJ School and the Strat Center. I was wondering if you could clarify a little bit the discussion of supply chain security, um, especially in agricultural markets, because those markets are increasingly more like oil markets or credit markets. They're global and fungible. You know, you open a new track somewhere, and it moderates or affects prices globally. Um, and it's not really to do with who owns it. There's not a narrow pipe back to the market of the owner. But I guess on the other hand, there's some fear that when you mentioned that China or South Korea, they're buying land for supply chain for food security, that there might actually be, in the scenario where you have rising food prices or rising transport prices, that they would actually attempt to protect it, and that would have you know, quite serious implications for local food security in Africa, even in places that are being productive. Um, but you know, who knows if they would actually be able to protect the land in that extent. Right. So I'm wondering which sort of side of you think our supply chain security generally do you see this coming down on? On the agricultural stuff, it's still pretty new. It's still pretty early days. Um, but, but almost all the deals on the agricultural side that I have seen have local market um, capabilities. That is, some of the production has to go to local markets. Um, and that's, for, that's not just for Chinese. That's, I mean, we're seeing that in Europeans. I mean, um, they're large banana companies, for instance, Chiquita and others, are, are uh, establishing pretty sizable plantations in Mozambique. And um, a certain percentage of that, of that banana crop will go local. Um, a large percentage will get exported, which is what the Mozambicans want and what Chiquita wants and everyone wants. Um, but there is always a local set aside. And I assume that's going to that's gonna be true for everything. Um, Particularly the grains, particularly most of Africa, maize, which is uh, corn, which is a, is, is, a, is a staple throughout much of the continent, that's going to have to, um, some of that crop is going to have to stay locally or else you're going to be back to your issues of, of how do you deal with that with, the, with your local growers and your local farmers. Um, on some of the, the minerals and the metals, um, we actually have seen a direct supply chain um, from, say, copper and cobalt in Zambia and, and um, Katanga, DRC, going directly back to Guangzhou. Um, that is, is definitely the, 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 the metal that is mined in those mines, exporting primarily through South Africa or through Tanzam and going back to China. So 
Um, we're, we, and, and other places like oil, for instance, that's much more fungible, and, and you're exactly right. That, that has less of a supply chain implication. Um, but some of the strategic minerals in particular, um, nickel, for instance, we've seen, um, having direct going back to going back to China. Yes. I was wondering, uh, you mentioned the Sudan earlier and its recent part of the session. No, it is a session. Um, and I was wondering, since China has uh, oil interest in the region now, a really, really young country, and you said there hasn't been much sort of transference of, uh, well, we talked about how there hasn't been much transference of culture from the Chinese the ethics. Do you think there's ever going to be a sense, especially in, um, with the waves of unrest going through North Africa, um, that among some of the young countries, whether or not you'll see nationalists saying, wait a second, you know, why are the Chinese here in the first place if they're going to bring in their own bottled water and not and take most of the profits? We want to develop uh, our resources ourselves, especially in a country like Sudan where you've got really, really new government and like a really, really young interest. It will be a fascinating case study. See how, how Juba handles that, because um, there's always been this tension between between Southern Sudan and the Chinese for a whole host of reasons. But um, you know the Chinese are very much courting Southern Sudan right now. Uh, but yeah, it, it, you do wonder where where's this where's this end? I mean, where, when do when do you know one side or the other say this isn't working? You know, get out of here. Um, and it's it, you know maybe maybe you go back and look at history and maybe is this neo-colonialism I don't know um, does it end like colonialism did I don't know uh, but it's going to be an interesting interesting dance to watch um, and I think your Southern Sudan is a is a great kind of laboratory and test case to look at it yes um, my name is Gao second year my home MBA. And I come from China, and I'm going back to China every year. <laughs> so I'll take the only discussion back to China. <laughs> so my question is about the role of World Bank, and actually, um, part of China's success actually should be attributed to the World Bank, especially our agriculture, uh, agricultural sector. And so I'm wondering, and um, what's your view or your idea about the current role of World Bank in Africa? And what's your expectation about their role and they should play in Africa? And how actually the Chinese companies, governments, they uh, interact, they you know, they collaborate, work, work bank very closely, or they just just walk into the room with the big pocket and just blow the work bank? And if any any active role actually more bank is not playing in Africa because we are going to talk about, we haven't talked about the climate, you know, the environment stuff. I'm thinking if there's some uh, collaboration between any foreign investment, not only China, maybe India later. So under a uh, uh, platform, you know, from the United Nations, uh, any, any, anything else or, um, for example, under the World Bank to co-develop Africa so we can protect our last, you know, beautiful land, the source in the world. Great, great question. Um, and the World Bank, as, as, as you probably are aware of, has had a, a, a long and interesting relationship with Africa. Um, they've had some great successes and they've had um, some real duds too. Uh, the IMF, it's the sister organization of course has had an equally interesting and sometimes difficult relationship with Africa, um, particularly on structural adjustment programs and and, and um, kind of reconfiguring African economies. <laughs> um, the World Bank, um, unfortunately, I think, uh, started to disengage from African issues in Africa, uh, agricultural issues in Africa, um, about 15, 20 years ago. The U.S. government did the exact same thing. Greg and I were talking about it earlier. USAID, uh, all 
kind of through the 80s and 90s for at least 20 years, did virtually no agricultural pro projects in Africa. I mean, we, 2020 hindsight, perfect, right? But it's incredible to us to think that we, we just walked away from the sector that employs 75% of all Africans are engaged in agricultural activity, and USAID was, did exactly zero agricultural products, projects. I mean, it, kooky. Um, and the World Bank was maybe not as bad, but, but pretty close to it. So the agricultural sector um, really has been ignored in Africa. Uh, and I think some of the Chinese agricultural practices are, that's a very interesting idea. It's a very interesting comment. Um, uh, wh who's had a better success of growing food than China? I mean, incredible. Um, India as well. I mean, the, you know, the Green Revolution was real. Um, so I, I think that's, a, that's an interesting perspective. And I don't know how the World Bank and China collaborate on, on agriculture in Africa. It's, uh, I'd be interested to find out.